next lecture is going to be talking about the uh, energy of life. Um, some of uh, the chemical reactions that are involved with uh, building the materials that life uses to power itself. Um, energy, what is energy, some of the different types of forms of energy, how it works, um, kind of how life uses that energy in the sense of chemical reactions, um, how chemical reactions work <clears throat> to kind of uh, form different chemicals that are needed by the body for energy, um, and kind of how life itself is powered. <clears throat> So what does life um, use for energy? Um, energy in life comes from the form of a chemical called ATP, which we'll get into in just a second. So energy is, uh, for life comes from the form of ATP, but first we need to define what energy is. So what is energy? You can see over here this bicyclist is using his uh, legs to do things, to power his bicycle, to uh, move the chain, to move that wheel, to move forward. Now inside of each single one of his cells, um, they're using tons and tons of chemical reactions to build ATP, um, to make energy, to power this bicyclist muscle cells, to keep him moving forward, to keep his cells happy um, and functioning. So what is really going on here on the energy level? What is this energy concept? Well, energy is just the ability to do work, the ability to move matter. So inside of each one of his cells, um, ATP is breaking apart chemicals, uh, breaking apart sugars and things like that, or breaking apart of ATP molecules, which we'll kind of get into in a second, um, to release energy that's contained within inside of those molecules. Now that molecule, that little energy molecule is released, um, that energy builds up over time and then is used to power something else, which then is used to power something else. Um, which then in turn eventually is all coupled together to power this muscle and this bicyclist, which is used to power his bicycle, which is used to move him forward. So energy is just the ability to do work, the ability to do something um, with um, the movement or with the matter that you're, uh, you're dealing with, uh, to move that matter that you have in some way, shape, or form, to manipulate it. Well, every single time um, that organisms take in energy, um, we bring in energy from the um, environment. We don't make new energy. We just take in energy from the environment and we change around that energy um, into a different form. You cannot make or destroy <clears throat> energy. The amount of energy in the environment, in the world, and the universe is constant. You cannot make more. You cannot make less. Now, you'll hear sometimes... Um, people argue that eventually things will run out of energy. Now that is true in the concept of something called a closed system, like an aquarium. Um, if you put a cage, a, ta a lid on top of your aquarium, and you never open it again to add in food, eventually what will happen is all the fish inside will die, they will starve to death, all the plants and things will die, everything will eventually die um, from lack of energy. <clears throat> now things like open systems, our planet is an open system. We get tons and tons and tons of energy, way more than we could possibly ever use from the sun every single day. So we are, uh, essentially, we have our uh, fish tank opened every day and somebody sp uh, shakes in way more food than we could ever eat. Um, so we are an open system, whereas a, a fish tank is a closed system. So the earth will eventually run out of energy when the sun burns itself out in a couple bajillion years, uh, but not anytime soon. As long as the sun is burning, we will have way more energy um, used to power life on Earth um, than we will ever need. Now, unfortunately, during this cycle, the uh, sun will hit plants, as you guys uh, recall. The plants will use the process of photosynthesis to convert um, this light energy that the organisms cannot use into sugar energy, potential energy. So let's talk about what these two different types of energies are here for just a second. So you have kinetic energy. And potential energy. So kinetic energy is stored energy, energy that's not being used to do work yet. So this sunlight, the energy from that sunbeam, if you guys know, is very hot. Um, we can harness that energy in the form of a, a solar panel um, and convert it to do actual physical work. So kinetic energy is often explained as a, uh, say, like, a, like you have imagine a table and a cup that's just sitting on the edge of the table. It won't take very much to knock that cup off the table. The energy that's stored inside of that cup just ready to go is called kinetic energy. It's just waiting to be used, just ready to go. So all the energy that's stored from our sun in those light beams that strike our planet on a daily basis is kinetic energy. 
this type of energy cannot be used to do work. It has to be converted into potential energy for organisms to use it. Now, we cannot um, use uh, kinetic energy to make potential energy. We, as in mammals, things that are not photosynthetic. Organisms that are photosynthetic, plants and algae and things like that, they can take this kinetic energy um, and use the process of photosynthesis to convert this kinetic energy into potential energy. Um, they will convert this kinetic that's not useful into some sort of chemical energy. Um, they'll take this uh, a bunch of carbon, there's a bunch of oxygens and things like that, um, and use the energy from the sun to glue those carbons and, and oxygens and things together um, into the form of a sugar, um, which then the sh plant can eat the sugar. You can't eat the carbons and the oxygens by themselves. They're not, they don't have any energy in them. They're not useful for anything. Um, but those carbons and oxygen all glued together in the form of a sugar actually takes this non-useful energy, combines it into a new form, and you get a useful product that contains stored energy. Now the plant can eat the sugar, break it down, and use the energy that's stored inside. Um, we can eat the plant and get the sugars that are stored inside of them, or we can eat the deer that ate the plants that ate the sugars, um, and so on and so forth, up until the point where you, you eat something that ate 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 the plant. Um, and every single time that something eats the original potential energy, the energy that's contained within this, some of it is lost, about 90% of it. Um, so let me go back a second. Um, about 90% of this energy is lost as heat. So it takes energy, takes money to make money. It takes energy to make energy as well. So what's going to happen is you have the oxygens over here, the carbons over here, all the other molecules and atoms and things, which will be assembled to make sugar, this conversion of kinetic energy to potential energy. Well, oxygens and carbons and hydrogens and things aren't just going to stick to each other randomly. If they did, they'd just glue to each other like a magnet. It takes energy to force those two things to form a bond together and stick together to make a sugar. It takes energy to make these atoms form a sugar. Plants have the machinery that can do that, but it takes gasoline energy to make those machinery work. That kinetic energy powers the sunlight powers the machinery, which turns all of that um, random atoms into actual useful energy. So plants are the only things that can do that. Well, it takes gasoline to make a gasoline, so every single time that this reaction occurs, kinetic energy is converted to potential energy, you lose a significant portion of the available energy in this kinetic energy through the process of making it in the first place, uh, making this potential energy. So the kinetic energy contains 100 um, energies. It takes 90 energies to make 10 energies, and that's kind of how this works. It's a 1 to 10 ratio for the most part. You put in 10, you get 1 out. Um, but if you didn't put in any, you wouldn't get any out, and then life on Earth wouldn't exist because we can't use this. <laughs> so um, we have to have this. We can't use this. So without this process, we couldn't live on this. Well, anyway, um, this process occurs every single time that you eat something. You eat something, um, so we can't make our own uh, sugars, we can't make our own foods, we have to eat the plant that made the potential energy. Well, you eat the potential energy in the plant, um, or deer does or something, they digest it, and then unfortunately it takes energy to power the deer. It takes energy to break apart the sugar and stuff. You put in 10 energy, you use 9 of it to tear apart the glucose, to tear apart the sugar, to power your own cells, and only one of them is available to be useful for actually powering the cells. Ten of them are lost as heat energy. You have to, um, to put in energy to make energy. So it's a very, very, very drastic reduction of uh, energy that's available for use every single time, unfortunately. Well, eventually what's going to happen um, is the energy is released into the environment through heat. Um, it's converted back to kinetic energy, the event uh, uh, ability to do work. Um, but this energy cannot be harnessed again until something else uh, can harness the heat and turn it back into potential energy. Um, once it's converted back, it's not going to be useful. Uh, once it's converted into heat energy, it's not going to be useful um, until something else can harness that heat energy. So how do or living organisms um, create energy inside of them? Well, you eat something, a very large molecule of sugar that contains lots and lots and lots of uh, carbons, lots and lots and lots of sugars and things like that. 
Um, and every single time you eat one of these sugars, um, your body's going to break those sugars down into smaller parts. So you can see down here, you have lots and lots and lots of stored energy inside of that sugar molecule. You break it down into some smaller molecules. And every time you break it, the amount of energy that's stored inside is reduced. So you break it in half, you get rid of some of the energy. Now you have two smaller pieces. You break those apart, some of the energy that's stored inside is released as well. Um, and eventually you're going to break it apart where you can't, so small where you can't break it apart anymore, and there's no more energy left to get out. There's no more bonds to break, no more sugar left to break apart, no more energy left to get out of here. Well, every single time that your body or cells break apart one of these sugar molecules and energy is released, the energy that's released can be used by your cells to do things, to make uh, smaller molecules, you can see here, into larger ones, to power your cells to uh, reproduce, to uh, make new DNA, to do things. Um, this is how cells get energy. They break apart larger molecules into smaller ones, and every time the larger molecules break apart, energy is released that can then be used by the cells to do things. So this is the, how we break down um, foods and break down things our cells do. Now on the top, um, there are other types of reactions that are used to build things up. Um, where sometimes you take in simple molecules and you need to build them into a larger, more complex molecules like DNA. Um, so you've got the you know, nitrogen, the carbons, and things like that that are involved in building DNA, and you have to build them into DNA. And DNA is just not something you can go eat in the environment, um, whereas you can go eat carbon and hydrogens and things like that, bring it into your cells. It takes energy to do that. Um, the energy that's released from breaking apart to those sugars is then used to build other things up, build d little tiny pieces up into DNA. So it's the same concept here. You eat a bar of candy, that candy is broken down in your body to make energy. The energy is then used by you to take all the nails, all the boards, all the paint and stuff, and then assemble it into a house. Same concept here. You eat a candy bar. The candy bar is broken apart, all the sugar is then released into energy, all the energy is broken apart. The energy that's released is then used by your cells to make DNA, to make more chromosomes, to reproduce, to keep you functioning as a happy living organism. Now all of the total reactions, all of the building up reactions, all of the tearing apart reactions inside of your body are known as your metabolism. How fast your body builds up and breaks down things inside of it. Um, lots and lots of things can influence metabolism, age, health, um, diet, and things like that, level of uh, exercise, so on and so forth. Um, so, um, it, like I just mentioned, um, you can see that reactions, chemical reactions occur in two different types, ones that release energy, um, I just mentioned that, um, and ones that take energy to make. Um, so, fairly easy to understand. If you have a thing that contains a lot of energy inside of it, um, you're going to blow it up, break it apart, and all the energy that's going to be contained inside of this building is going to be released in chaos out into the environment as it's exploded. A bunch of junk, all of that nice organized building is going to be um, exploded, and then a bunch of tiny little chaos, all the energy that's going to be contained inside of the sugar molecule is going to be exploded um, and released for the cells to do energy with. Um, and then you can, or to do actions with, I should say. Um, and then up here you can see all of the energy that's going to be released is then going to be collectively harnessed to do things. And so up here you can see that these guys are raising a barn. Well, um, energies like photosynthesis, these things require energy. This is how life on Earth gets all of the energy from um, non-living matter to start with, where all of the initial energy comes from. So all of the oxygens, all of the carbons, all of the hydrogens and things out there that are going to be assembled by plants to make sugars that power everything on else, else on Earth gets that initial energy from the sunlight. The energy comes from the sun that is then used by the machinery inside of the plants to assemble all of those building blocks into larger sugars that can then be used by the plants to make uh, food for themselves, to, uh, for them to eat, and then for every other organism to eat as well. Um, when the plants break apart those sugars, cellular respiration, or our cells break apart sugars, um, we release the energy that's inside of that sugar for our cells to use to power things inside of the cells, power reactions, um, power making things, and so on and so forth. Um, um, reactions, chemical reactions, come in two different forms. 
um, for the most part, that this is what's going to be going on in your body. Um, you can explain reactions fairly simply with this concept of oxidation and reduction. So an oxidation type reaction is it going to occur um, when atoms or molecules are, uh, lose electrons. So electrons have tons of energy stored inside of them. When an, uh, an atom loses that electron, um, it loses the energy that's contained inside of that electron. Um, so if, an if a reaction um, breaks apart an atom or a molecule or something like that, um, some of the electrons will be lost and given over to a different molecule, um, and that's known as an oxidation reaction. Now, when this happens, the energy that's uh, contained inside of that electron goes with it. So this atom over here, this molecule had a lot of energy in it. It's now lost some of that energy when it gives away that electron. So the uh, molecule that receives the electron is going to be referred to as reduced. It gains an electron. And then in turn, whatever energy that this molecule lost, this guy got. The electron went to him. It carried some energy with it. This guy now has that energy inside of him. Now, what you'll see here is that every single time this occurs, this protein here is going to use the energy of this electron to do something. Well, when you do that, you lose some of that energy as heat. That's just an unfortunate reaction. It takes energy to make energy. It takes energy to do stuff. You takes money to make money. You have to burn a little bit of energy to do something. So some of that energy is going to be lost as heat. Now every single time what's going to happen is the electron is going to move to the next protein to power it, so on and so forth, eventually down to the very end where that electron will have no energy left in it whatsoever. Um, it had a lot of energy at the start. It was reduced. Um, this molecule was oxidized. This one was reduced. Um, a little bit of ox energy was lost in the process to reduce this one, to reduce this one, to reduce this one, to reduce this one all the way down and eventually this electron over here lost all of its energy that was stored in it, no longer has any energy to give, and eventually it needs to be gotten rid of. In this case, it's oxygen, which will take it and carry it away. Um, and you breathe that out, um, and that's how we get rid of our um, bad electrons after they're done. So let's talk about what cellular energy is. How do cells power themselves? What is cellular gasoline? What is energy to cells? Well, this is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine, adenine, right over here. It's a ribose sugar in triphosphates, phosphate group one, two, and three. Hence the tri meaning three, phosphate meaning phosphate group. So three phosphates. One adenine, um, same concept in DNA, ATGs and Cs, and then three phosphate groups, and then one ribose over here. This is essentially an RNA molecule um, with two extra phosphates on it. Oh, no, anyway. Um, so ATP um, is uh, bonded together, these phosphate groups, um, with bonds that contain lots and lots and lots of energy inside of them. This has been uh, converted from kinetic energy, the uh, ability that's ready to do work, into potential energy. This is essentially like having a, a twisted up rubber band um, inside of every single one of these bonds holding these phosphates together. You guys know the second you let go of that rubber band, it's going to twist out. Um, and ready to do work, all that stored energy inside of it. So each one of these bonds, bond right here and bond right here, each one of these phosphate bonds has tons and tons and tons of energy stored inside of it. If you break this bond, the energy that's held um, inside of this bond will then be released. That energy that's released can then be used to do work inside of the cells. ATP will transfer this energy once this bond breaks, from whatever it's um, from ATP into whatever is next to it, which you guys will see in just a second. So how this works: ATP is going to be hydrolyzed. It's going to be split um, you, uh, from ATP into a concept or a new molecule called ADP, adenosine diphosphate, meaning two. So ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which has a ton of stored energy inside of it, um, will be hydrolyzed. Um, you split apart the phosphate group here. Once you break that bond, all of the energy that's held inside of that bond will then be released. Um, that energy can then be used by the cells to do things. Um, this ADP, the molecule that remains, this phosphate group will be transferred um, to a different molecule carrying the energy with it. 
the phosphate group takes the energy with it, which then is used to power the new machinery, which you guys will see in a second. The ADP, this adenosine diphosphate, will then be recycled back into ATP. It takes energy to do this, which we'll talk about in just a second. So, how this works. You eat energy. You bring in sugars. Those sugars are then broken down into smaller molecules. Those smaller molecules, you guys can see here, you ATP, you make that energy, you break apart the ATP. The ATP is then broken apart into ADP, which is then used to power your cells. Um, that energy is then used to do things inside of your body, and one of the main things that it's used to do is to make more ATP, to make this ADP back into ATP. Fuse this ADP back with the free phosphate group to make ADP into ATP again to power the whole cycle. So some of it's used to power your body and some of it's used to make more ATP. And you guys will see in just a second how this is just a cylinder. So um, ATP um, can be used to glue things together. So this is the concept of transferring that energy here. So you guys will see here ATP is going to come in. Um, ATP is going to have a bond inside of it that's broken. You guys can see here that one of those phosphate groups from ATP will be transferred from, a pho from um, the ATP molecule to the glucose molecule. When it's transferred, the energy that's contained inside of that phosphate group, that bond, will be used to fuse the glucose to another glucose molecule next to it. It forms the bond. When that phosphate group stripped away, the energy is gone, you have ADP that's left, it floats back off into the environment, and that phosphate group stays stuck over here. So ADP just floats back out into the cell, and ATP stays over here. ATP can also be used to power reactions inside of cells as well. So you can see here, you have ATP coming up. This is the outside of the cell here. This is the inside of a cell. Um, and this is going to be something called the sodium phos or the so, uh, potassium phosphate, or um, I can never say this word, um, so potassium, sodium potassium pump. There we go. Um, so this is going to work against something called a concentration gradient, which we'll talk about in just a second. So um, you want to move things in and out of the cell that are too big. It takes energy to do this. So what's going to happen is you have to open and close this little uh, protein here, you guys can see, to uh, release things in and out of the cell. So what's going to happen is things from the inside of the cell, these little purple balls, are going to float up inside and be ready to be released to the outside of the cell. ATP is going to come up with it, all of its stored energy inside. One of the phosphate molecules is going to be broken apart, taking all of the energy with it into that protein. All of the energy is going to be transferred to the protein here. Once the ATP molecule is stripped apart, it's turned into ADP again. The ADP just floats back into the cell. All the energy in sort of that phosphate group is going to be transferred from that phosphate group into the protein. That protein will then change its shape, um, do the actual work, do the work required that this um, ATP was going to fuel, and then open the protein to release these things outside of the cell. Um, that phosphate group, once the energy inside of it's been released, been used to do the work, the phosphate group will fall apart and then be used to make more ATP later on. So um, life inside of us, um, life in general, occurs very quickly. Um, and for life on Earth to continue, um, it takes tons and tons and tons of ATP per second to fuel your bodies. Um, you have millions of cells. Um, you have to have them all working in tandem with one another, all in sync. And for your body to be able to do that, it has to be able to make millions and millions and millions of ATP molecules um, per second to do this. So life in all of the reactions that are surrounding life occur very quickly. All the reactions to make ATP, to make ADP back into ATP and things like that, to break ATP in, down into energy occur very, very, very quickly um, inside of our cells. So sometimes we need to speed up reactions that might take um, a very long time to occur um, without some help. So since ATP and ATP or ADP and ATP have to be made inside of our cells, we could essentially have our cells just wait around for ATP um, to turn into ADP again. Eventually, this phosphate would come in and stick to the uh, uh, the ADP molecule and form an ATP molecule. It takes a really, really, really long time. You don't have time to wait for that. 
It's you're gonna die waiting for enough energy to randomly form inside of itself, enough ATP to randomly form for your cells to be able to survive. You can't wait that long. So since um, we have to get going, it requires so much things inside of our bodies, um, so much energy, so much sugars have to be broken down to make energy. Um, it takes a lot and lot of energy to continue us to run, our cells to function. We have things called enzymes, which kind of cheat this system. Um, this is like a, you could throw all of the uh, building blocks of a house inside of a, 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 an empty lot and hope that they eventually get turned into a house. Or you could hire workers to put the house together. And enzymes are workers. What these guys do is they quick speed up reactions that um, would take forever. Um, they lower the amount of energy that would take um, to make in things happen. Um, they can make reactions that would otherwise take a really long time. Um, occur very quickly. Um, there's a couple of other things that they do. And one of the things that's really interesting about enzymes is they're not broken down over time. Um, so ATP, as you guys recall, is eventually going to be broken down into ADP. Every time it's used, um, it's broken down. It's, um, it's a one-time use. You have to make more of it every single time. Now, enzymes don't work that way. They're kind of like a renewable um, source of workers here. They do one thing, they change their shape, and they can do it again. Now, enzymes are really cool. Some of them, most of them, to, or excuse me, all of them, um, for take energy to work, which we'll talk about in just a second. But let's talk about how these things work. Um, an enzyme is essentially just a specialized protein that does something for a cell. Um, the cell might have a really hard time breaking apart large sugar molecules or building up large sugar molecules from small pieces um, by itself. So what we have is a little enzyme which can do that job for the cells. It makes it really easy for the cells. So enzymes have something called an active site. And an active site is where things are going to bond to them. So if you're an enzyme that puts two things together, or in this case something that breaks two things apart, your enzyme, your active site, will contain little tiny uh, holes, little tiny pores that fit things that will plug into your active sites that you're going to be tearing apart. Now enzymes are very specific. Um, if you're an enzyme that's meant to break apart sugar, um, only glucose sugar, glucose is the only thing that's going to be able to fit inside of your active site. You guys will hear a lot of the key and lock concept. This is the lock. The key is the only thing that can fit inside of that one lock. So anyway, what's going to happen is this substrate will fit inside the active site if it fits properly, if the charge is correct, if the size is right, all that good stuff. If it fits in there like it's supposed to, the enzyme and the substrate will form a complex, and the enzyme will then change its shape using some energy to do something to break apart that substrate into two smaller pieces. Now the opposite can be said. Um, where you can do the uh, building up process. You can take two things in, use some energy to fuse those two things together, and then release a fully formed substrate on the other end of this. Now, one of the other big things that enzymes do is they speed up reactions by lowering the activation energy of something to uh, occur. Now, if you had to wait around um, and add heat to break apart sugar, you guys can understand um, this concept. If you want to boil water on your stove, um, if you just put water into hot or into cold or sugar into cold water, it takes a really long time for that sugar to dissolve. The energy that's required to make sugar dissolve is very, very, very high. It takes a lot of sugar to do this, or a lot of energy, excuse me, to dissolve that sugar in water. Now, if you add some heat, you raise the energy level of that water. The energy that's needed to dissolve that sugar is drastically reduced because the water is a lot hotter. Now, enzymes do that exact same concept. If you had to break apart sugar inside of your body by just cells tearing, trying to tear it apart with DNA and things like that, or uh, proteins trying to tear it apart um, without an enzyme's help, it would take a lot of energy to do so. Or to try to build up sugars just by having them randomly uh, clang into each other would take a lot of energy to make that happen. Enzymes can lower that activation energy, the amount of energy that's required to make something occur. Um, so if something in your body takes a lot of energy to occur um, without an enzyme, um, an enzyme can make the energy that's required by your body 
um, significantly less. So enzymes are very, very, very helpful um, in uh, lowering the amount of energy that you have to spend to do things that you need. So sometimes um, you eat a lot of sugars. You need to break them down quick. Sometimes you don't eat a lot of sugars. So your body's going to be breaking down things slowly. Sometimes you need to make a lot more energy. If you're exercising, you're running away from a bear, you need to keep fuel going for the body. Um, and then sometimes when you're just chilling on the couch, you don't need to make as much energy. So how do cells control how much energy, how much chemical reactions, how fast the metabolism is going on inside of them, how fast things go on inside of cells? How can they control this? Well, one of the ways that cells can control how fast things go on inside of them is by regulating the enzymes, how fast the enzymes that they use to control chemical reactions to make products and things work. Well, one of the ways that cells can do this with an enzyme is by introducing something called an inhibitor. So you guys can see here we have our active site on a normal functioning enzyme just doing its thing the way it's supposed to look. And our little substrate's going to come in. It fits perfectly. It's a perfect square. It's got the right shape, the right charge, the right size. Fits right in there. Clicks the enzyme's going to use a little bit of energy and do its thing um, and control, uh, change the substrate around and uh, do exactly what it's supposed to and spit out a product. Well, sometimes you got way more product than you need. We don't need to make any more, so let's turn our enzymes off. You can do this by inserting something called an inhibitor. And you guys can see over here there's two different types of inhibitors. There's something called a non-competitive inhibitor and something called a competitive inhibitor. So we can't get rid of our enzymes. That would be really wasteful. We don't want to break apart our enzymes. We don't want to destroy them. We don't want to break them and burn them apart because if we have to rebuild them, it takes a lot of energy. Um, it's kind of like knocking down your front door the, uh, every single time you want to go outside. Uh, you need to come inside instead of just unlocking the door. It's very wasteful to do that. Kick down the door, destroy it, buy a new one every single time you want to come inside. Why not just use the key? So that's exactly what they do. Cells, when they want to not make stuff or make not as much, they just lock the door. Um, instead of kicking it down, instead of getting rid of it, they just lock it so nothing can come inside. Well, anyway, um, one of the ways that they do this is by inserting something called a non-competitive inhibitor. So a non-competitive inhibitor is kind of like uh, somebody holding the doorknob. Um, you put the key in, it fits right, but it doesn't fit well enough anymore. You can jiggle it, you can jiggle it, you can jiggle it, you're just not going to get the door open. Um, and then you can have something called a competitive inhibitor, which actually physically goes in and uh, blocks the active sites, like putting glue in the keyhole. Um, it's not going to be able to bond no matter what. Now, cells can regulate how much of an inhibitor, how many inhibitors block enzymes, how many enzymes are blocked, and how long these inhibitors stay in an enzyme. So um, if you have a bunch of substrate, a bunch of product, you can wait until that product number is diminished, until you don't have much of it anymore, and then you can remove the inhibitors and make more of it. Once the number is made uh, re uh, um, increased again, you got a bunch of products, you can reinsert the inhibitor and turn off that process again. Negative feedback is the concept there again. Um, if you want to review some earlier lectures, um, we talked about the process of negative feedback when it comes to homeostasis. Um, building a lot of things as they go uh, decrease in measure, you will start to make more of them until the number is um, increased again, and then as the number is reduced again, you will make more of them, and it's just a constant cycle of how this works. So the enzyme, you'll have a lot of product. As that product's reduced, the inhibitors are removed from the enzyme. Products are made. As the product reaches a certain number, the inhibitors are added back, which then allows the product to be uh, uh, consumed, and then so on and so forth. Well, the uh, activity of enzymes can also be um, impacted by a couple of other things as well. Temperature is one big one. If you're too hot or too cold for your uh, enzymes, enzymes in humans um, are evolved to work perfectly at human body temperature. That makes sense. They live inside of us. They function inside of us. They work inside of us. They do work for us. Um, we run at 98.6. It would make perfect sense that the enzymes inside of us work at that same temperature. That is termed their optimal temperature. Anything cooler than that or anything hotter than that, you guys know that humans tend to have problems. Um, hotter your, or cooler, your enzymes slow down. They don't work as well. Um, they tend to slow down how fast they make energy, how fast they make cellular products and things like that, um, which then can lead to the slowing of your body functioning, um, and then eventually it can lead to death. 
Well, every single organism on the product has different enzymes that are evolved for different temperatures. And that makes sense if you think about it. Organisms live in different environments, like bacteria that live down deep in hot springs. Their environment's around 75 degrees Celsius. They live there. They're, they need to be able to function in 75 degrees Celsius. So their organisms, are, their, excuse me, their enzymes um, are evolved to function at 75 degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius, excuse me. Whereas if you put them in a 40 degrees Celsius, like us, they would die. Their enzymes would be too cold. They couldn't function at all. And if you added us to a 75 degrees Celsius hot springs, our enzymes would cook. It would boil them. They cannot work um, in either one of these. They, each enzyme has something called an optimum temperature. Um, and the farther you get away from that optimum temperature, the less effective up until the point where they no longer work at all the enzyme gets. Um, salt concentrations, pH, and things like that can also influence it, and the same thing occurs here. Um, this is the concept of a salt pH balance inside of humans. Um, you hear alkalinis, um, alkalidosis, things like that. Um, ketosis, um, people that are uh, hypoglycemic, hypoglycemic, um, things like that can all impact um, how fast your enzymes function. They all have a certain salt, sugar, pH that they like, um, same for every other species on the planet as well. You're evolved to live in a certain environment. Your enzymes are obviously evolved to live in, to function in that environment as well. Um, if you change the environment, the enzymes might not work as well. Well, how do cells regulate the amount of things that come in and out of their cells? Um, you guys are probably familiar with the concept of osmosis and diffusion. So let's go ahead and talk about those a little bit in more detail. Um, and kind of how cells use energy to influence this concept. Well, inside of a cell, you guys will see here, this is our inside of a cell here, and our outside of the cells over here. Inside of the cells um, are always going to have different concentrations of things, water, or not water, um, salts and sugars and things, than you will find on the outside of the cell. And this makes perfect sense if you think about it. Cells need lots of sugars to work. If there's a lot of cell, uh, so obviously there's going to be more sugars on the inside than there are on the outside. The outside of the cell doesn't make sugars. The cells do make sugars. So there's obviously going to be more on the inside than there are on the outside. But sometimes cells are going to encounter environments that have lots of stuff on the outside that they need and not a lot of stuff on the inside. So how do cells regulate this balance? How do they get stuff in between? How do they make sure that they're in the environment that they like? How do they make sure that they are happy? Well, a um, couple of different ways that cells can do this, and one of them involves energy and the other one doesn't. Well, one of them can be things entered through the cell um, through the process of something just called simple diffusion. Now, simple diffusion works on something called a concentration gradient. Now, concentration gradients, now, um, excuse me, but all, both of these work on the concept of a concentration gradient. So let me just talk about a concentration gradient for a second, and then I'll elaborate a little more. So what is a concentration gradient? Well, concentration gradients occur when you find um, large amounts of something at one side of a, 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 of a, a thing. So this is going to be the outside of our cell, um, and the inside of our cell. Now, in this case, it's literally just a, a, a fade from black to white in pixels. So I'm going to go through this. So anyway. Up at the top, you will see a large amount of black um, and a small amount of black at the bottom, fading to white. Um, we can see a nice, smooth concentration gradient from black to kind of a dark black, through a light, a dark gray, through kind of a light gray, a lighter gray, and then all the way to white. A very smooth concentration gradient from a very high concentration of black to a very low concentration of black um, down here. This is a concentration gradient. Now, nature itself naturally wants to go from a concentration of high to low. High to low does not take energy. If you have a bunch of balls all sitting up at the very tip top of this uh, box up here, um, so kind of a flip through this in just a second. So if you have a bunch of balls sitting up here at the top, it's going to take uh, energy to hold them there. Now you're going to let them go. They're all going to fall. Eventually what's going to happen is they're going to hit and they're going to bounce back up. But they're never going to bounce back up as high. So every single time the amount of energy that's used to bounce is reduced. Every single time they bounce back slower and slower and slower until eventually all the energy is lost and all of the balls will fall down here and be 
piled up at the bottom. Now, if you want to make this thing even all the way through to make these guys bounce constantly the whole time, all the way equally distributed like this, where they don't just all pile up at the bottom, um, it this takes energy. If you want them all at the bottom, or, or all at the top, excuse me, this takes energy to do this. You have to put energy into this system to be able to break this concentration gradient. They're all going to want to naturally pile at the bottom after the energy is all gone. The energy wants to go from high to low as the energy is dispersed out into the environment and gotten rid of. If you want to go the opposite direction from low concentration to high, you want them to go back up to the top. It takes energy to do this. Now, cells work on this concept, uh, concentration gradient concept. There's always going to be more stuff inside the cell or more stuff outside the cell than there is in the other. And cells have to compensate for having more stuff inside or outside of their cells by either getting rid of that stuff or bringing stuff in to make themselves happy. Now, cells can do this by one of two ways, like I mentioned already. Using energy, these two down here, active transport, endocytosis, exocytosis, or not using energy in the form of something called passive transport. So let's go ahead and jump into these and figure out what these things are and kind of how they work. So passive transport occurs simply by that concept of concentration gradient. This is diffusion, just simple diffusion. Things naturally, energy is stored up here, it wants to get rid of the energy, things are going to move from outside the cell or inside the cell where there's a lot of them to outside the cell where there's not a lot of them. The concentration gradient is going to go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. This does not take energy. All this energy stored in here, all these molecules are moving, bouncing off one of each other, clanging onto one another, um, bouncing around. As they bounce around, they're going to move apart, and eventually they're going to spread out across, um, be pushed across this molecule here. You guys can see this concept if you uh, um, spray some perfume up in the corner of the room. Um, eventually what's going to happen is it's going to fill the whole room with smell. High concentration of perfume and where you spray it, and it will spread out into the low concentration of perfume into the room until eventually it is equally dispersed all throughout the room. And if you want to put the perfume back in the bottle, that takes energy. So cells work the same way. Lots and lots and lots of sugars on the inside of the cell. Eventually what's going to happen is they're going to be moved outside of the cell simply because of that concept of energy, high concentration to low concentration. This does not take energy at all. This is simple diffusion. You're just moving along that concentration gradient, high concentration to low concentration. Um, so simple diffusion, once again, you can see here they use an example for a tea bag here. Um, our tea bag has a high concentration of tea inside of it. You put it in hot water, it starts to dissolve the tea molecules. The tea molecules move from a high concentration out of the tea bag into the low concentration of tea um, into the water until eventually what happens is they are equally dispersed. Everybody occupies the same amount of space. The e energy is equally dispersed all throughout this entire glass here, and the concentration gradient becomes equal. There are no spaces that have higher concentrations of tea then lower concentrations of tea than there were over here, higher, lower. Eventually, it all becomes equal when the concentration gradient runs out of energy, um, and it all becomes equal here. Now, osmosis is the movement of water in this same concept here. Now, water, um, we're going to add in our biological uh, membrane here. Water can move across biological membranes very easily. Water is one of the only things that can move across pretty much every single type of biological membrane on the planet freely without the input or uh, of energy. Now, sometimes things, uh, solutes, things that are dissolved in, wa in water, salts and sugars and things, are too large to move across these biological membranes. Here, you guys can see here this big purple, or excuse me, green, uh, blue, and white uh, membrane. That molecules are too large to go through the purple uh, membrane here. They're too big to go through these holes. So since they can't go through the holes, um, water is going to move through the holes. It can go through the holes freely. Water is going to attempt to balance out the concentrations of these big guys on both sides of this membrane here. So there's more on this side over here, as you can see, than there are on this side. So water is going to move from one side to the other, move from here to here, to dilute this concentration to make them both equal. This is just how water works. Now your cells have this same problem. 
they cannot control the what movement of water in and out of their cells. Um, so if you put uh, cells in different sugary environments and things like that, it can cause some problems. So your blood in itself um, is something termed an isotonic solution for the most part. Isotonic means there's an equal concentration of solutes, things that are dissolved in blood on the inside of the cells as they're on the outside of the cells. There's no sugar on the outside, then that there's, or excuse me, there's equal amounts of salts and sugars on the outside of the cell as there are on the inside of the cell. Since the what cells cannot control the movement of water, um, water is just going to move in and out of the cells at the same rate. There's nothing out here to dilute. There's nothing out inside to dilute. So water is just going to flow in and out and not move very quickly or move in one direction to another to dilute that concentration gradient. Now, um, if you put your blood cell in a concentration of solutes that are higher inside the cell than there are outside of the cell. So this cell ate a lot of sugar, um, and then you put it in just instantaneous fresh water. There's no sugars inside of it at all. The sugars are too big to get out of. Water's going to rush, or to get out of the cell, excuse me. Water's going to rush inside the cell and try to dilute the concentrations of sugar inside of that cell to where it's equal to the outside environment. And this is what happens to people with hyperglycemia. Um, hypoglycemia, on the other hand, um, you have a lot of concentrations of salts and sugars and stuff in the environment, um, and this is in the blood. What are blood cells are going to uh, not have a lot of salts and sugars inside of them. Water is going to rush out of the blood cells um, and try to dilute the environment. So when the water rushes out of the cells, the cells will shrivel up and shrink, and uh, eventually they can die. Now over here, um, water rushes into the cell. The cell will uh, plump up and it could potentially cause it to pop. Um, both of these are bad. You don't want these in your body. You want normal functioning red blood cells in a nice isotonic equal salt, equal sugar solution as they are on the inside. Um, too much salt, too much sugar in your blood can lead to one of these conditions here. Now, um, sometimes you have molecules which are too large to fit through these semi-permeable membranes here, but they need to go across the cell membrane anyway. And this can be accomplished through the aid of a channel protein. Um, this is a concept called facilitated diffusion. So you've got a little membrane protein here. Um, and this essentially is going to uh, be a little tiny tunnel that takes some things across the cell membrane. Now, if a, 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 um, a molecule is positively charged or, uh, um, or negatively charged, it can't pass through the cell membrane very well. Um, if it's hydrophobic, it doesn't like water, um, or it doesn't like, or uh, the the cell membranes will try to get rid of it. So these types of um, things that your cells need have a really difficult time crossing the cell membrane to get inside or to get out of the cells. So to get inside of the cells and out of the cells, um, for those types of molecules, we have a little protein, a little channel of protein. It's essentially a tunnel um, that just allows them to pass back and forth through. It's just big enough for them to pass through. Nothing else can get through it except for the stuff that's needed to go through it. Um, it only carries things that cannot pass easily through the cell membrane, um, and this does not require energy. Now, let's talk about moving things in to our cells against a concentration gradient. Let's say you need to move stuff into your cell, and you've already got a ton of it in your cell already. You got a bunch of sugar inside your cell, but you just ran into a bunch more sugar and you want to go ahead and eat all of that. It's going to take energy for you to move something against the concentration gradient. High to low takes no energy at all. That's just naturally how molecules move. They bounce around, they flow out, they spread out. Um, if you want to move something from a concentration of low to high, that takes energy. So this is something called active transport. If a cell's got a lot of sugar on the inside that they made, they ran into a bunch more sugar, they want to get that sugar inside their cells, it's going to take energy to do so. So, um, now in this case, they got a bunch of stuff outside of the cell and a lot, a lot that inside the cell that they want to get rid of. So, this is a, from low concentration to high, we want to get stuff outside of the cells into that high concentration here, we're moving them out. So, in this case, it takes energy. Naturally, things want to go this way, they want to flow in the cell, they don't want to go out. These little guys, they want to be equal on the outside, so things want to come in to equalize them. Well, anyway, um, so you're going to move one of these guys into this little protein here. Um, energy is going to be come up. ATP is going to transfer the energy from uh, one of its phosphate groups to the protein here. 
ADP is going to be released. The phosphate group is going to transfer the energy into the protein, change the shape, and kick this little guy out on the other side against the concentration gradient. Low concentration, too high. This takes energy. Um, well, sometimes we need to move really big things in and out of our cells. Um, and you can do this by two different ways, endocytosis or exocytosis. So endo meaning in, endocytosis meaning cell, cytosis cell in the cell, allows cells to bring in really large particles. Um, so say you found a lot of food or um, a big piece of DNA, things, a lot of fluids, things that you need to bring in large amounts of. So what's going to happen? Um, is the cell membrane is going to uh, have those substances land on the outside of it, of the cell. What's going to happen is the cell is essentially going to see, as you can see here, going to start to pinch in and kind of uh, form a little ball around this substance. Um, so it's going to in, uh, uh, suck it up and form a little thing called a vesicle, a little ball of cell membranes um, that entraps these um, um, mem uh, substances that could be food, could be water, anything like that, inside of this little vesicle here, these little cell membrane balls. And it brings it inside of the cell, um, and this takes energy as well. It takes energy to do this, to bring your cell, to uh, break it off, to bring these things inside of your cell. But you get quite a lot of food, so the amount of energy that's put into this is worth it. Um, and then sometimes you need to get rid of waste products. Um, and this takes energy as well, active transport, to get rid of concentration gradients, to move lots of stuff out of the cell at once. Um, so it's the exact opposite of exos or endocytosis. Um, you start out with the fully formed one with the waste products inside of it. You stick it up against the cell wall, you f or cell membrane, you fuse it in, and you empty all the goodies back out into the environment. So it's this, but in reverse. Um, both of these types of things require energy. Um, and both of them go against concentration gradients, low to high. It takes energy to bring these things into the cells, and cells do this for a reason. Well, that's pretty much all there is for this one, guys. Um, if you have any questions at all about this uh, lecture, please feel free to contact me. If not, have a good rest of the day.